first John, that letter is an exposition of that great 15th chapter of John of what it means to abide in Christ because he uses the same word in those five chapters of first John 20 times, the word that is, a, that is translated abide. It may not be translated abide always in first John, but 20 times in that he uses that same original word. And so I think it's an exposition of what it means for a believer to abide in Christ. I don't think that what he's talking about are the birthmarks of a believer. In other words, I don't believe that 1 John is actually uh, how you can prove that you're saved. I think rather it is a book on abiding in Christ and how you can prove whether or not you're being sanctified. John's letter is actually built around three things that begin with the letter L, which is easy for us to remember. And these three are all connected. See if you know what they are. The first L is life. The second L is light. And the third L is love. Life, light, and love. These three are not only what First John is built around, but they are the very nature of God himself. Life, light, and love is who God is. And that's why all three of those things, if you think about it, are part of the Son of God becoming a human being, his human birth. You open, for instance, John's gospel, the first chapter, and he's introduced as life and light. And remember how John says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And so life, light, and love really, I think, explain the first John letter. And I want to say that Jesus gives life, Jesus sheds light, and Jesus pours love into our hearts, into our lives. And that's the way that I want to look at first uh, John this evening, just quickly. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we can't do this without you. We know we can depend upon you. You said that if anyone wants the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, simply ask you, and you're a good Heavenly Father, and you give to those that ask. You said ask and we will receive. And so, Lord, I'm asking and thanking you. Thanking you. Thank you, Lord, for giving to us your Holy Spirit and thus an anointing an unction from the Holy One that enables us to have insight and uh, invigorated understanding of Scripture. So tonight, use these thoughts from 1 John to stir our sincere minds and really to continue that work of transforming our hearts, our lives. For Jesus' glory, his sake, we pray it. Amen. So let's talk about the first L. Let's talk about the fact that it's Jesus that gives life. First John, I've had you turn there, right? Uh, first John chapter one. Look at how the chapter begins. The book begins. The letter begins. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. This is John, the apostle, one of the 12 that spent, what, three and a half years with Jesus during his earthly ministry. We saw him, we heard him, uh, we looked upon him, we touched him, our hands handled of, notice what he's called there, the word of life. Jesus is the word of life, John says. Read verse two. For the life, Jesus is the word of life. John says, Jesus is the life, was manifested, was made visible, and we have seen it. 
with his own eyes. We bear witness. We show unto you, notice, that eternal life. Three times, Jesus is identified as life. He's the word of life. He is the life. He is the eternal life. You know, we talk about, oh, I am a recipient of eternal life as if it's a thing. But actually, eternal life is a person. It's a relationship. When Jesus is presented as the life, and when we are told that Jesus is the one that gives us life, he's talking about relationship. He's talking about himself. You see, life is a person. Jesus gives life. John opens his gospel by saying, in him was life. He gives life. Why does he give life? Because that's who he is. Jesus is life. So it makes sense that he'll give life if you'll take him. And Jesus is life. And he gives life. He's called the word of life. He's called life. He's called eternal life. Remember what he said to Philip? When Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough. And uh, Jesus said, have I been so long with you, Philip? And you're saying, show us the Father? He said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And then he said this, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So when we talk about Jesus as the life and as the one that gives life himself, a person, we're talking about relationship. But no relationship is entered into unless you partake of it. You have to partake of this person who is life in order to be given life. You have to receive life. You have to receive Jesus. And when a person receives Jesus, they receive the life of Jesus himself because they receive Jesus himself inside of them. God, the divine nature, comes to permanently reside in you when you receive Jesus. When you become a believer, you become a partaker, Peter tells us, of God's nature. Something of the very nature of God himself enters into you. I mean, that sets you apart from any other human being on the planet. You have God's DNA in you. You have God's, I say, divine nature abiding, DNA. You have God's nature in you. That's what we're told. You become a partaker of life. And uh, you become a recipient as a result of supernatural, powerful, resurrection, life, listen to me, himself, <laughs> himself, Jesus. You come into union, you come into a oneness with God, and that opens the door then to the second L in John's little letter, and that's light. Life gives light. When John opens his gospel, he says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He sheds light. He gives life, but he also sheds light. God is light. That refers to the fact, not relationship, but that refers to fellowship. Look with me. 1 John chapter 1, again, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, literally keeps on cleansing us. From all sin. Keeps on cleansing. So when we talk about Jesus being the light, the one that sheds light in us, we're talking about fellowship with him. That's what these verses are telling us. It requires a walk. 
of course, a walk with Jesus. In the, uh, the first chapter, again, of John's gospel, I think it's the ninth verse, he says that Jesus is the light that has come into the world that lights every man. Now, that's interesting when you think about it, because what that tells us is that there's not a human being ever born on this planet in the past, presently, or ever will be in the future that does not have some connection to God in their life. He lights every human being. There is an intuitive light of God in the human person. Now, it gets quenched. It gets, it gets darkened pretty quick. But that's what we are told. He's the one that sheds light. And when we as believers walk, walk in the light, the opposite of light, we are told in uh, verse 6, is darkness. And uh, darkness, of course, is sin. Notice what he says in verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. You get it? Sin, darkness is sin. And I think in the, to in the context here, the kind of sin he's talking about is, uh, is referring to an unintentional, unintentional doing what's wrong in God's eyes. I think that's a definition of what sin is in the believing life. For the most part, sin in the Christian life is viewed as something that we don't really want to do. <laughs> it's unintentional wrong. He says, if any man sin, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So to walk in darkness, I think, refers to sin. And God wants believers to sin less. No believer is sinless, but he wants us to sin less. That's what I get from that first verse of chapter 2. And uh, we sin less as we grow in grace and as we, we mature in faith. Look at verse 13 of chapter 2. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And then uh, look at uh, verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I think that the point that he's making in the context is, I want you that have grown in grace and have matured in faith to sin less. <laughs> that you sin not. That's what he's talking about. That's who he's talking to. But new believers, new believers, through their faith in Jesus, they slip the bonds of enslavement to sin, and they even escape Satan's death grip. Look at verse 13 again of chapter 2. And uh, he says there, I write unto you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. He says in verse 14, second part of it, I have written unto you, young men, because you're strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. He wants us to walk in the light, which is the opposite of walking in darkness, which is walking in sin. He wants us to sin less. He wants us to walk in in fellowship with him. Because when we walk in darkness, we're not in fellowship. And he has come as the light to shed light into our hearts, into our lives. So the shedding of that light, it requires a walk. But what's the way that we're to walk in the light? Well, God supplies ample provision to walk in the light. For example, the moment a person receives the life, receives Jesus, he is at that very instant, simultaneous to that, is severed from his or her former union to sin and the world. 
Remember how Paul puts it. He says uh, that having been crucified with Christ, we have died. The old man was crucified. That old unregenerate human spirit is dead and buried. And we have been raised to new resurrection life. The very life of Jesus is in us because its life is Jesus. And so, as a result, that union with, and also, remember Paul says in Galatians, he says, I'm crucified to the world. And the world to me, I've been severed in my relationship with the world. I don't have the same relationship to the world that I had before I was saved. And so that's the way God supplies ample provision to walk in the light for us by doing that and giving us Jesus's resurrection life that actually pulsates within our inner man, our inner person. So you can be in a permanent relationship with God and yet through sin be temporarily out of fellowship with God. You still have eternal life but you certainly don't enjoy it. You don't appreciate it. Look at chapter 2 again with me. Drop down to verse 24 and 25. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. What he's talking about is fellowship with the Lord, enjoying fellowship. You see the word uh, remain, and the word continue, uh, the word abide, all in verse 24. That's the word that I said always appears in John 15. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. It's the same. He's using the same terminology. He's talking about the abiding life which enjoys fellowship with the Lord. So it's necessary to stay in fellowship. In fact, you'll never be ready for Jesus is appearing if you're not walking in the light, if you're not in fellowship. And you certainly won't be rejoicing in Jesus's any moment return if you're not walking in the light, if you're not in fellowship with him. Look at what he says in verse 28 of chapter 2. He says there, and now little children, abide. There's the word again. Abide in him, that when he shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Life, light, it's all part of the abiding life. Well, you want an example of walking in darkness? I'll give you one. Look over at at verse 9 in this same second chapter. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness until now. Now, I want you to know something here that perhaps maybe you haven't noticed before. The guy who is hating is a brother, and he's hating another Christian brother. He's not talking to lost people. He's talking to believers that actually hate other believers. You walk in darkness. This is an example of what it means to walk in darkness, to be out of fellowship with God. You walk in darkness when you hate your Christian brother. And then also, here's another thing that causes you to walk in darkness. Second chapter again, drop down with me. Uh, Let's see. Drop down to verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man loves the world, the love of the Father is not. Talking to Christians here, not not unbelievers. These are believers that are loving the world, and as a result, they're walking in darkness. What does it mean to love the world? Well, I'm not going to answer that now, but what's the answer to hate? That's the question. What's the answer to hating your brother, walking in darkness and being out of fellowship? Well, the answer, of course, is God's love that is within you already. Because Jesus is in you, and he is love personified. Bible says 
in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 that if you're a believer, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And that's the answer to hate. It's God's love within you, but it has to be tapped. It has to be claimed. It has to be utilized. It has to be depended upon. So here's the third L. It's love. He is the one that gives life because he is life. He's the one that sheds light in us because he is light. He's the light of the world. He's the one that pours love into us because he is love. In fact, look at chapter 4 and verse 8, and we read, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, that doesn't mean that the person's lost. This is a book written to believers. But you don't really know God. You don't know God experientially. If you don't love your brother. God is love. This is who Jesus is. This is the Jesus that lives in you. The God that lives in you is love. And chapter 2, verses 7 to 17 is all about that. It's all about uh, uh, loving the brothers in the Lord. It's about not loving the world that we're living in, the system that we're living under. I mean, there's more about love and uh, loving your brother in chapter 3, verses 11 to 24, chapter 4, verses 7 to 20. I mean, it's all over this letter. Because God's love. Now follow with me. Three L's in the first uh, epistle of John, first letter John wrote. The first one is life. That's about relationship. The second L is light. That's about fellowship. The third L is love. That's about worship. And here's how I mean that. The fact of the matter is, When Paul says that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, that that term shed abroad, it's an amazing word. It's a word that, I hate to say this because it's a bad analogy, but it's it's the same word that's used in the original language. You remember when Judas hanged himself? Remember that? And his body, his dead body fell, and the Bible says that his innards gushed out, shed abroad, gushed out, same word. The idea is this, God's love gushes out abundantly in you. And when that happens, because that is true, the first thing that you will do is you will love God. You will love him. It will be a love first for him and then others. We worship when we love God supremely. We'll never worship until God is number one. When God's number one, then we worship him. When he's supreme in our love life, then we really worship him. You know, I don't, it really doesn't matter how much we love family members or or spouses there should be no comparison between that and our love for god he's first and this is this is what it's about that first kind of love is what god is looking for and that's often what's missing in, in our lives jesus had commendable things to say about the church at Ephesus. I mean, they were a solid Bible-believing congregation. They had it down. They were able to identify false teachers and false teaching and reject it. And he commended them for that, but he then said, but I have something against you. And that was God, their love for God wasn't first. In their heart. They were dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, but their love was cold. 
And when our love for God waxes cold, it doesn't matter how doctrinally sound we are. It doesn't matter to God. He doesn't want that. He wants love, number one, first and foremost. Not that he's unconcerned with doctrine, not that he's unconcerned with soundness, but God wants us to love him first and foremost. He wants our love for him to be so supreme that if you would compare our love for our family to our love for God, it would seem like hate. That's what he says. He says, if you love husband or wife, father or mother, child more than me, you're not worthy of me. You can't be my disciple. I, I mean, this is cutting it really thin. This really is making it plain. God wants us to have him first in our hearts. We minister to him first before we minister to anyone else. And then that love is first. And it's really fire. <laughs> it's, it's a spiritual fire. It's a love for God that he wants it to be red hot. He wants our love to be on fire. And it's impossible to worship God until we love one another. And in fact, if you love God this way, you will love your brothers. You will love one another. You will love Christians. Even if you don't know, you'll love them because they're part of the same family. You can't really worship either if you love the world. If you love the world, you can't really worship. You can attempt to. You can look like you do. But you really can't worship if you love the world, because we saw it in chapter two, if you love the world, the love of the father isn't in you. You can't love the world and God at the same time. It's him or it's the world. So you can't be attached to the world and the things of the world. You can't love earthly things because earthly things, your love for them will extinguish the fire of your supreme love for God. And even if those earthly things are people, you can't love them more. Simply love God first and let that fire burn and consume you. And you know what will happen? You'll automatically love others. And you will not love the world nor the things of it. He ends his letter in chapter 5. In verses 20 and 21, I wanted you to see this. By really tying the three L's together, life, light, and love. In verse 20, he says, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given an understanding that we may know him that is true and that we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. We live in him, that's what he says in that 20th verse, and we fellowship with him, and then in verse 21, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Well, that has to do with love. Life, light, and love. <laughs>